about renewal, all 435 members up uh, for re-election or election every two years. And we're excited by the talent, the energy, the ability uh, that will be joining the House Democratic Caucus uh, in the next Congress. We're also excited that so many of our frontline members who are in incredibly tough races, hundreds of millions of dollars spent to try to stop them from coming back to Congress. And almost every single one of our frontline members are re returning to continue to do the business of the American people. House Democrats, get stuff done. We deliver lower costs, better paying jobs, safer communities. We put people over politics. And the American people have recognized that. Under the most challenging midterm conditions possible. But the American people recognize that. And the other side of the aisle is in complete disarray. Vice Chair Pete Aguilar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As the Chairman mentioned, the caucus meeting was, was, was fun, it was lively. Uh, hearing the biographies and the uh, uh, resumes of our new colleagues uh, really just reinvigorates the, the energy of the caucus. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to pay our respects to those who are uh, retiring and, and moving on, um, but the energy was, was fantastic, and we congratulated all of our colleagues on their hard-fought success while we continue to count votes. But it was very clear that voters across this country rejected abortion extremism. They rejected extremism when it comes to democracy, rejected individuals who want to cut Social Security and Medicare, and they rejected MAGA candidates who continue to put our country and our democracy at risk. The American people clearly want us to work together. They want us to solve problems. And that's the moment that we're in now. We have a chance to make continued progress if Republicans are willing to work together, or they can choose a path of partisan investigations that will send a clear message to the American public that they don't deserve to ever hold a majority. We're going to continue to work hard, as the chairman mentioned, to lower the costs of everyday Americans, to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. Those are the priorities of the House Democratic Caucus and will continue to be the priorities of the caucus moving forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pete. Questions? Well, we're focused uh, right now on welcoming our new members, an extraordinary group of individuals and Americans, as Pete has said, uh, and also making sure that we count every single vote in the races that are still out there, because there still is a path toward 218. Whatever happens, House Democrats have vastly overperformed expectations, and we will have momentum going into the 118th Congress. But we are at a point in time uh, where the focus should continue to be on making sure that every single vote is counted. But even given that, do you think that it's time for new leadership in your party? I think it's time to make sure that we finish the business of the American people over the next few weeks uh, before the end of the 117th Congress, and also to make sure that we keep the focus on counting every single vote in the races that are out there, candidates who are on the battlefield, a few of our incumbents in races that haven't been called, and we're going to continue to support their efforts. Second row. Thank you. Um, so in the lame duck session, can you kind of talk about the priorities? What do you think Democrats can get done while you remain in the majority for the time being? Yeah, well, I want to yield to Pete on that, particularly given uh, his uh, expertise and focus as a member of the Appropriations Committee. But it is certainly the case uh, that we have to make sure we arrive at a year-end spending agreement to continue to fund the priorities of the American people uh, and to make sure we have a fully functional government. I believe that Speaker Pelosi and Leader Hoyer, Leader Schumer, President Biden have talked about some of the issues that they'd like to see resolved. We have to stand uh, up for the people of Florida and Puerto Rico who have been devastated by natural 
disasters, make sure that there's a sufficient amount of COVID funding uh, that is available uh, to be able to continue to beat back the pandemic. President Biden has done an extraordinary job of working through this once in a century public health crisis. And we want to make sure that that job can be completed. Uh, we also have to stand uh, with the free world and the efforts of the Ukrainian people to push back against Russia and Putin and aggression and totalitarianism. And I expect uh, that additional funding for Ukraine will be part of any year end agreement. Yeah, I think I think all of that's right. I think the chairman um, uh, hit hit the points that are important uh, funding government and making sure uh, that uh, Rosa DeLauro and our colleagues in the Appropriations Committee uh, have the, the ability to uh, continue to negotiate. I think there those conversations continue uh, at this point. Um, the emergency supplemental uh, that will be needed for Florida and and Puerto Rico, uh, obviously the aid to Ukraine. Uh, we hear a lot of talk on the other side of the aisle now about conditions uh, that, that they might want in the future uh, related to that. Uh, our support for Ukraine is unconditional, and we want to make sure that we that we honor that. Um, and uh, clearly, and, and Hoyer, Leader Hoyer mentioned it uh, this morning as well, a fix for, for DACA. Um, the courts have put DACA at risk moving forward, and we want to make sure that we uh, offer the ability uh, for these individuals who have had DACA status and are American in every way except a piece of paper um, to uh, continue uh, and to have, hopefully, a legislative solution uh, to a path to citizenship. Um, we, the Democratic Caucus has led on this issue from the original DREAM Act to the USA Act to the discharge petition when Republicans uh, were in control. Uh, to the Dream and Promise Act that we have passed, to the U.S. Citizenship Act uh, that has been introduced by Linda Sanchez. I mean, we have time and time again uh, stood uh, on the right side. We're waiting for Republicans in the Senate to do the same. Uh, we need 10 votes, uh, and I'm sure that Senator Padilla, Senator Menendez, uh, Senators Cortez Masto, uh, and Ben Ray Lujan, uh, as well as uh, Chairman Dick Durbin, uh, are, are working on these issues uh, as well. But uh, we hope that they can uh, resolve them and we stand to be willing partners uh, in that discussion moving forward. And for Vice Chair Aguilar again, um, Donald Trump just clearly demonstratively snubbed the January 6th committee. The deadlines came and y'all didn't have a clear path of next steps ready to announce. What do you do now? Well, I think it's been pretty clear from the individuals that he associates as well that he was was not interested in in cooperating uh, with with our subpoena. Um, we have proven that there are consequences to individuals who who don't comply, um, uh, and I think you know we'll eventually you know continue to have the next word um, you know on these issues, and we stand ready to to work and continue to work through the final report uh, that will be uh, out between uh, now and the end of the year. And, um, you know, really our effort has been so nonpartisan. Um, and I think that's the, the legacy of the committee is that we're going to continue to to move forward, engage in this process, put together a good work product, uh, do it together. Um, so we understand that the, the former you know, occupant of the White House, um, you know, clearly made some decisions to, to snub us uh, yesterday. Um, you know, we're confident in our in our work. Uh, and that history will judge the work that we've done uh, to hold uh, him uh, and individuals around him accountable. Back. Chairman Jeffries, uh, what about the debt ceiling? Have you uh, got any plans to try to take care of that in the lame duck? I think the leadership of both the House and the Senate has indicated that it's something that we need to take a look at. And here's why. Extreme MAGA Republicans, led by the so-called leadership on the other side of the aisle, have said that they're going to hold the economy hostage, potentially blow the whole thing up. Why? Because they want to detonate Social Security and Medicare for tens of millions of Americans. Now, it's that type of extremism that was just rejected by the American people all across the country. But they don't get it. They'll never learn. And so I think it's going to be important for us, responsible members of Congress, led by Democrats in the House and the Senate, to address this existential threat to the economy, to everyday Americans, certainly to Social Security and Medicare. What was leadership 
message to new members this morning about their future in leadership? Uh, the focus today was on discussing a few of the items uh, that we expect to be taken up over the next several weeks that are of importance to the American people. But as Pete has indicated, as I've indicated, it was just really a warm and triumphant space. Seeing so many of our frontline members back in the Congress preparing to continue to serve after surviving incredibly well in tough elections, notwithstanding the fact that the other side of the aisle have been measuring the drapes for a so-called red tsunami for the last two years, but they're back. And to see so many uh, dynamic colleagues ready to do the work, that's the difference. Democrats get things done. We actually want to make life better for everyday Americans. And we've done a pretty good job of doing it. The American Rescue Plan, save the economy, shots in arms, money in pockets, kids back in school, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, millions of good paying jobs created. Also to fix our crumbling bridges, roads, tunnels, airports, our sewer and water system, our mass transit system, high speed internet access in every single community. Gun safety legislation for the first time in 30 years that will save lives. The Chips and Science Act to bring domestic manufacturing jobs back home to the United States of America, as opposed to our jobs going in the other direction, which has been happening for 30 years. And of course, the Inflation Reduction Act to strike a blow against the climate crisis, set our planet on a sustainable trajectory forward lower energy costs, strengthen the Affordable Care Act, lower health care costs, and drive down the high price of life-saving prescription drugs. Democrats deliver for everyday Americans. We get stuff done. We put people over politics. And the other side of the aisle is extreme. They're out of control. They're off the hook. They don't believe in democracy. That was rejected. They don't believe in reproductive freedom all across the country. That was rejected. They want to detonate Social Security in five years. That was rejected. And so battles were won that are extraordinary. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're off the battlefield. We have to continue to fight for these priorities, for lower costs, for better paying jobs, for safer communities, and to defend freedom, defend Social Security, defend democracy. And we're excited that we're going to have the opportunity to continue to do that. Um, you talked about how last Tuesday Democrats overperformed their expectations, but one place that Republicans were able to see some gains was in your home state of New York. It looks like the House majority is going to come down to a handful of seats. What do you make of the fact that, that those slip seats in New York really could have been majority makers for Democrats, and why did that happen in New York? Yeah, we'll see what the final margin uh, is. As I indicated, we still have a pathway to 218. Uh, but. I do think some of the conversations that are happening in New York right now are going to be important. I've suggested that there should be an after-action analysis with a focus on the state Democratic Party, a focus on some of the statewide campaigns, and try to figure out what happened in Long Island, what happened in the Hudson Valley. More importantly, how do we fix it? Assess the situation, but don't agonize, organize, and prepare for what comes next. Donald Trump is likely going to announce that he's running for president. Do you want Joe Biden to be the Democrat who runs against him in this upcoming cycle? Joe Biden is a big and clear winner. Everyone said uh, that President Biden's agenda is too ambitious. He wasn't elected to do all of these things. The American people will reject it. Everything that we've done is incredibly popular. And our frontliners ran on that policy agenda, and so did our candidates. Why shouldn't Joe Biden? He said he's going to make a decision over the next few months. I'm hopeful uh, that President Biden will seek re-election, and I look forward to strongly supporting him. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I know you don't want to entertain the idea of being in the minority, but there also is a strong pathway for Republicans to yeah, This is definitely a Pete Aguilar question right here. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to ask, you know, Republicans have more or less said publicly, definitely privately, that they will need your help to pass 
number of mass pass legislation next term if they are in the majority. Have you had Republicans reach out to you in recent days to try and forge relationships? Are you open to forging those relationships? And should the caucus be open to working across the aisle? I think uh, Speaker Pelosi has always made clear and the leadership within the House, every single member of the House Democratic Caucus, some of our accomplishments that have been extraordinary during the current 117th Congress have been bipartisan in nature. We've consistently indicated a willingness to work with Republicans to get big things done. In fact, that was the case going back to the prior presidency. We worked with the administration to get the First Step Act done under a Republican House, Senate, and a Republican presidency to strike a blow for criminal justice reform in a way that brought both sides of the aisle together. We worked together with Republicans to pass the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement on President Trump's signature political issue. But we worked with him because we understood it was the right thing to do for America, for organized labor, for working class and middle class folks. And so I think our track record speaks for itself. Uh, we are always guided by doing the right thing for the American people. I think that's the metric of, of this caucus is, does the policy help our communities and does it help our country? As the chairman mentioned, his own leadership on the First Step Act, uh, the work that we have done in, in prior administrations, um, I think should, should speak for itself. Uh, I personally led some efforts uh, to solve DACA uh, when Republicans were in control, joined with uh, Republicans uh, who supported a discharge petition to force bills to the floor so we can have resolution on this. I think 19 Republicans uh, joined a discharge petition against their own leadership to do it. So we've got you know, relationships and, and we can have conversations with individuals across the aisle when the policy is right and when the policy matters. But if Republicans are going to engage in the continued extremism that we've seen over the past few years, then I don't know if there's, you know, an appetite. Um, the policy is going to have to dictate that, uh, but they're going to have to to work to silence their extreme voices uh, within their own caucus when it comes to achieving results for the American people. Because when it comes to the infrastructure bill, when it comes to these big pieces of legislation, those have always been been bipartisan. And, and we hope that there are bills in the future uh, that meet that threshold. Um, but I don't know if, if this leadership on the other side of the aisle can string together uh, enough willing participants uh, to do that. Uh, but we're going to hold out hope because the American people want us to work together. I think that was a resounding uh, message from last week. And, and uh, we're always going to uh, uh, hold out hope that this new Congress um, can uh, uh, operate in that, in that same way. Go back to this side. Uh, in the wake of the attack on Paul Pelosi um, a couple weeks ago, I'm wondering what sorts of conversations uh, leadership, the caucus is having about security for members, and if there's discussion of possible affirmative steps to increase security for members. Well, the two relevant committees in that regard are the House Appropriations Committee and House Administration Committee, so I, I'll, I'll yield to Pete. <laughs> um, but, uh, but there have been ongoing conversations amongst the members as well as amongst the leadership about ways to continue to strengthen um, the infrastructure around the safety and security for members of Congress in an environment of increasing political violence and dangerous rhetoric coming from extreme forces uh, throughout America, including the former president of the United States of America. And so it's an honor and a privilege to be able to serve uh, the people that we are elected to represent in the House and the Senate to do the best possible job in that regard, uh, members and their families should be safe and secure. Under the leadership of Chairwoman Rosa DeLauro, some important steps have already been taken. Additional funding has been made available to try to secure, um, you know, the members when they are back home in their districts. and. Chairwoman Zoe Lofgren has also taken some strong steps to heighten the coordination involving the Capitol Police, the Sergeant-at-Arms, 
and local law enforcement back at home, and I expect that additional steps will continue to be taken as needed. Yeah, just echo what the, the chairman said, uh, Chairwoman DeLauro and, and Chairman Tim Ryan uh, and, and Chair Zoloffgren have really put us on a path where this is uh, something that uh, we uh, continue to, we feel, make progress on. Um, there's more steps to take, and obviously as a caucus, our, our, our hearts and our thoughts go out to, to Paul Pelosi. Uh, he's someone who is a, a figure in our in our meetings, in our dinners. Um, he is a frequent you know guest, and uh, we spend a lot of time um, with uh, with members of the leadership and their families. And so uh, we're we're thinking about him in these in these times as well. As the chairman mentioned, uh, this hot rhetoric um, uh, is troublesome and worrisome. And I can tell you. Uh, one of one of the things you've heard me say before is I don't talk about member security, and 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 that's that's going to hold true. But I will tell you, this continues to be a topic of among members. Members are concerned. New members are concerned, and we need to do everything we can uh, to help that. Uh, we need to talk about the local coordination um, efforts that that are available to them. Uh, we need to support the the ten thousand dollars that was in the in the budgets uh, for uh, each of us to look through security. Uh, we need to hope that Republicans um, join us in ensuring that something like that continues in in future Congresses, and that that should be a, a bipartisan issue. Um, so those are those are our hopes, and we're going to continue to uh, work within the committees of jurisdiction. Uh, to ensure that uh, that that gets done, but this is something that that members, you know, continue to to talk about often. Question. Question of interest to the business community: uh, There's talk of a, a, a tax extenders package, research and development uh, and amortization, and then some Democrats talk about child tax credit. Do you see that as uh, a possible land duck item that gets passed? Here? Well, it's my understanding that there are discussions. Those discussions are going to presumably be led by Chairman Richie Neal. I have great faith and confidence in him um, to try to negotiate something that makes sense for the American people, for American families, uh, but also for the economy, for commerce, uh, and for businesses that are committed to creating uh, good-paying American jobs. Anything else on this side? No. Circling back to New York, um, do you think Jay Jacobs should go as chairman of the Democratic Party? I think we need an after-action assessment of what went right, what went wrong, and what can be done better. Uh, that should focus on the institution and not any one particular individual at this point in time. Uh, Congressman Cuellar said he got calls from uh, allies of uh, Leader McCarthy trying to get him to switch parties and wondering if your side has done any outreach to any Republicans. And assuming Republicans take the majority to be a narrow one, would you guys try to work with breakaway Republicans to elect some sort of consensus speaker? I think that's all premature uh, until we have some definitive resolution on who gets to 218. But think about this for a moment. And I know for a fact that outreach has taken place to Representative Cuellar. The nerve of these individuals and how desperate are they that they literally just spent millions of dollars mischaracterizing Henry Cuellar's leadership and talked about the emergence of a red wave in the Rio Grande Valley, then get wiped out by Cuellar and Vicente Gonzalez and want to run to them saying, we need your help because we're struggling, because the American people rejected our extremism because they saw us for who we are and are not confident, despite all of the gerrymandering that took place across the country, including in Florida, which may actually be decisive, but we'll see what happens at the end of the day. This wasn't an effort that they've earned at all. And now we see how desperate they are reaching out to members like Henry Cuellar, literally days after he just defeated millions of dollars spent against them. With Wired Magazine, curious, any discussion going on about what to do with Bitcoin and crypto and all this stuff after the collapse of FTX? Well, I think that's an issue that I presume will be taken up uh, by the Financial Services Committee under the great leadership of Maxine Waters, as well as uh, the Agriculture Committee, uh, 
under the leadership of David Scott, both of whom uh, in different iterations could have jurisdiction uh, over issues related to crypto, and we'll see what happens. But this hasn't been at the leadership level? It wasn't an issue that was raised in the caucus meeting today. Millions of people. I think there are a whole host of issues yeah. that I think we are planning on working through. And I could imagine that the situation related to the cryptocurrency industry will be one of them moving forward. House Republicans have said oversight and investigations will be a major part of their focus if they take the majority. How are House Democrats planning to push back on this? Yeah, I want to yield to Pete on this, but think about this for a moment. This is why extreme MAGA Republicans are in such a bad spot and are not right for our country. We are working to emerge from a global once in a century pandemic, working to deal with global inflation, working to make our communities safer. All issues where Democrats have acted over the last two years in an extraordinary way, but Democrats recognize that more needs to be done. And what is right at the top of the extreme MAGA Republican agenda in the House? Let's investigate President Joe Biden's family. That's what they want to do. That is the message that they're sending to the American people. It is not a winning message, but that's what happens when you are captive to the hard right. And House Republican leadership is captive right now to the hard right. And the situation didn't get easier based on what happened in the midterm election, it got harder for them. At the same time, Democrats are going to continue to focus on kitchen table, pocketbook, bread and butter issues like lower costs, better paying jobs, and safer communities for the American people. I think it's, I think it's very telling that the, the Kevin McCarthy applause line, you know, he wants in his job interview is that he's going to, you know, defund the January 6th committee and send that money over to, you know, investigations. Um, that's who he's speaking to. He's speaking to the House Freedom Caucus because he needs to count these votes. He's not speaking to the issues that the American public want addressed. He's not speaking about the economic uh, uh, issues of the day. He's not speaking about you know, how we make communities safe because he's trying to string together the number of votes uh, to be to be leader. And I think it's an unfortunate state of, of where our politics is on that side of the aisle. Um, but we're not going to be deterred. Uh, our, our values are going to be uh, the same. Our focus is going to be the same. How do we uh, how do we stabilize these issues? How do we make life better uh, for Americans and, and working class individuals in our communities? Uh, that's what our focus is. All right, last two questions. Um, given that Democrats don't really want to discuss the leadership situation until after your races are called, you guys are, that might take a few days, maybe longer. Um, and then you guys are out for Thanksgiving and your leadership elections are currently scheduled for November 30th. Is there any chance you guys might push that back a little further? Or is that date set in stone? Yeah, there's no plan to change the date uh, of the leadership elections. And more importantly, the organization uh, in preparation for the 118th Congress that will take place beginning on Wednesday, November 30th. All right, we got two more questions. We'll take the last two. Yeah. Uh, All right, thanks. third row, and then we'll go back I to the I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, are there still discussions right now in leadership about uh, whether to revive um, the permitting reform uh, proposal that Senator Manchin wanted attached to the CR uh, back in September? Yeah, that issue may have come up in the Senate discussions. I think that's a question uh, perhaps best directed to Leader Schumer or Whip Durbin, but it didn't come up uh, in any of the conversations that we had earlier today in the caucus. Thank you. And with the former president's uh, announcement coming as soon as tonight, does this make it more urgent for Democrats to pass legislation like the Electoral Count Act or for the January 6th Select Committee to wrap up its work? Um, well, with respect to the January 6th Committee, I'll, I'll, I'll yield to Pete on that. Chairman Thompson has done an incredible job. All of the members of the January 6th Committee have done an incredible job in lifting up the challenges that our democracy has confronted because of the events of January 6th and before when the former so-called twice impeached president of the United States perpetuated the big lie that led to a violent insurrection. 
and did a whole host of other things to inspire the attack on the Capitol as the January 6th committee has so uh, forcefully and comprehensively and in a bipartisan way documented. But the interesting thing about the former president, who apparently is going to make an announcement uh, today, which is kind of extraordinary, the so-called GOP red wave turned into a red wedding for extreme MAGA Republicans and election deniers in race after race after race all across the country. Here's the Republican response. The cult leader should run again. And we're going to double and triple down on extremism. We're going to double and triple down on a nationwide abortion ban. We're going to double and triple down on attacks on our democracy, and we want to eliminate Social Security and Medicare. That's extraordinary. But that is the modern-day Republican Party, as compared to Democrats who deliver big things for the American people on the issues that matter, including around the economy, job creation, lower costs, and safer communities. There isn't anything that the former, the twice impeached president can do that would impact the, the January 6th the work that we have ahead. Uh, that, like I said, this has been nonpartisan work, uh, nonpartisan work under the leadership of Chairman Benny Thompson and Vice Chair Liz Cheney. Uh, we look forward to our work product standing the test of time and speaking for the day of January 6th and what led up to January 6th. Um, and uh, we we look forward to the conclusion of that work. Our, our view has always been uh, that uh, this was a select committee that serves at a, at a point in time uh, only for this Congress. Uh, that has always been our focus and our goal. Um, new information came up that necessitated more hearings uh, that bumped back the final report um, a little later than maybe we would have wanted. Uh, but we want to make sure it's fulsome. We want to make sure it's right. And not, nothing uh, that goes down in, in Florida is going to affect uh, our focus on that. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.